Luke chapter 9. Let's bow in a word of prayer before we look at God's word. Father, we thank you for this day. We give it to you with anticipation and with thanksgiving. We are grateful for uh, all the benefits, Lord, that you send our way. Help us also to be thankful and grateful for the tough times you use to build us, to turn our hearts and attention and, and uh, attitudes toward you. We pray that in every way you will find us to be faithful. Lord, we lift you up this morning. We thank you for your What's going to be? Okay. Luke chapter 9, and we're beginning in verse 37. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, you'll remember that they have just been, Peter, James, and John, with Jesus on the great mount of transfiguration where they met up with Moses and Elijah. When they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. I would imagine uh, if some of you who just got your new smartphone somewhere along the line, distant past, not too distant past, do you ever have a, a teenager come along and explain your smartphone to you? I almost guarantee you that it won't be very long into that process and you'll say, I didn't know it did that. Uh, those smartphones that they make today have monstrous capabilities that most of us never tap into, right? We don't even know they're there. But guess what? God also has monstrous capabilities and capacities that most of us never tap into. The trouble is that we are what I like to call unbelieving believers to one degree or another. We're truly saved. We've come by faith to Christ, and so we can be classified as truly one who is a believer, but much of our life is lived on a different plane, a plane that is unbelieving, that's untrusting. And so our unbelief ties the hands of God. Let me just try to give you a little example of this. Every, every worry, in a sense, is a declaration that God isn't big enough or strong enough or loving enough to take care of me, right? Every outburst of my temper is a declaration that I'm better able to defend my rights than God is. Every disobedience to one of his very clear and specific commands in his word is a declaration that I know better than God. And so, in a sense, without meaning to, we trim his sails. We limit his scope in our lives because with each one of, of these kind of instances in our life, we're, kind of, we're dropping anchor in unbelief and we're living, we're living like who we who we who we were before Christ instead of like who we are in Christ. We're unbelieving believers. We all do it. We do it every day. We do it without even thinking. And our text today is urging us, don't be an unbelieving believer. Let's make some progress in this area. Now, the context, you'll recall, is the disciples, Peter, James, and John, at least, have been on this great mountaintop experience. Peter says there that they were eyewitnesses of the majesty. He says that in 1 Peter 1, of the majesty. 
But while mountaintop experiences are great, and we need them occasionally, we need the inspiration that they bring to our lives. It's not where we live, is it? It's not where we exist. It's not where our daily life is lived out. And so it's important to understand that what we experience there isn't the thing that's going to go on all the time. But look at Luke chapter 9. Look at verse 43. The last verse we looked at it says, and all were astonished at the majesty of God. That was the reaction to the crowd after Jesus had cured one of the worst cases of demon possession that we find in the New Testament. The crowd declared his majesty. And the word majesty that's used there is exactly the same word majesty that's used in 1 Peter 1. So Peter's saying, I saw the majesty on the mountaintop, and the crowd is saying, we saw the majesty in the valley. That tells us that the majesty of God was present in both places, beloved, and it also tells us it's possible to bring the majesty from the mountaintop down to the valley where we live. That's what the Lord wants for us. You know, we used to sing this song when I was a kid. I'm sure most of you will not remember hearing this, but we used to sing this song where it said, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. It's a great song because it expresses the way it's supposed to be. It's intended to be that way. And it's only limited in scope, the ability for heaven to come down and fill our souls by our unbelief. And so God is asking us here to begin to put into practice what we learn on the mountaintop into our daily experiences. We, when we don't do that, we become kind of, we're, we're, we're walking, talking oxymorons, right? We're believers who don't really believe. We're unbelieving believers. Kind of good news, I guess. We're in good company because the disciples were as well. That's, that's what was going on here. When Jesus said, oh, faithless, in verse 41 there, oh, faithless, which, which means without faith or unbelieving. The words are the same in the Greek language. Oh, faithless and twisted generation. He's not talking to the crowd. He's talking to the disciples. The disciples are the culprits. It, in their unbelief, the glory would have never come down. But thankfully, Jesus was there, and it did, and it still can. And so I want us to look at three, just three simple things here today that will help us understand how that can help, that, that that can happen, and help us understand how to make this our experience, not just the experience of the people in this story. So what's the first thing we need to understand and, and, and get into our hearts and minds? Well, the first thing we need to understand is that our world is bound. Our world is bound. We live in a world that is bound by sin and Satan. And really, you don't have to look very far to see that, do you? We live a privileged existence in the United States of America, but you certainly don't have to look very far to see the bondage, even here, let alone in other places. Look at verse 37. And the next day when they came down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. You know what Luke is doing here? Now, we didn't read back just the context just prior to this that we'd been studying in previous weeks, but, but, but that's where it comes in the context of this passage. And Luke, it's like Luke is putting up big neon lights here saying, look at the contrast. Please notice the difference. The contrast between the mountaintop and the valley is absolutely stunning. Glory on the mountain, tragedy in the valley. The majesty of God on the mountain, the cruelty of Satan, in the valley. A son of God on the mountain, a demon-possessed waste of a son in the valley. A sovereign father on the mountaintop, a helpless, tortured, miserable father below. One son 
who is a destroyer of demons, another one who is destroyed by demons. Luke is saying, look, there's a huge difference. And the difference when you look at the passage, beloved, is really clear to see. What's the difference? The difference is Jesus. Jesus is always the difference. And when Jesus comes, he can bring the mountaintop to the wreck of a world in which we live, but without Jesus, there is little hope. This boy is a shattered wreck. The description itself is, is bad enough, right? It says he cries out, he, can, he convulses, he foams at the mouth. Some have looked at those uh, descriptions and said, well, he's, this is just a case of, 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 of uh, he's an epileptic. So the Bible makes it very clear, that's not what's going on here. This is a case of demon possession. Matthew adds the details that the demon often threw this boy into the fire and into the water to, de- to try and destroy him. Mark adds the detail and that he was both deaf and, and mute. So imagine, if you can, this, 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 this young boy standing there, scarred from the, the things that he's been through. He can't speak and he can't hear. You can imagine his eyes just fill with with terror every time there's about a, new, a new attack comes on him. And the father can do nothing but stand by and watch this. It's about to destroy the boy and it's about to destroy the father. They're absolutely helpless in the face of this relentless enemy. But what, what God is doing here and the reason he's put this in his word is he's depicting for us the world that's in bondage. To sin, that's, it's not like we all walk around demon-possessed every day and we have the same kind of experience this boy has. But even as we enjoy the good life that we often experience, apart from Christ, we have to realize we are hopelessly enslaved to sin. And we live in a world where that's the norm. Jesus said, remember what Jesus said in John 8 to the, to the church-going a very well-to-do, you know, getting along just fine in life, people that he was talking to in John 8. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You ever practice sin? Then the Bible says we're a slave to sin. In our fallen, broken world, right is wrong, and we see this more all the time, and wrong is right. It's an upside-down place we live in, beloved. Because it's a world bound by Satan. And if we don't come to Christ, if Christ isn't at the center of our life, the sin will take us down, just like it's taken this boy down. Not in the same way, perhaps, but it will certainly take us down. Part of our problem is we don't see this so clearly because because. Because this bondage is invisible. It was very clear in the life of this young man, right? Everybody could see that. We don't see it so easily in the world in which we live. And so we expect, we expect the norm to be comfort. Trouble surprises us. And so when trouble comes, what are we doing? Well, we're, we're standing around saying, this isn't supposed to happen to me. Lord, what, where are you? What's going on? How come this is allowed in my life? We wonder if God is in control. If he's in control, why is this going on? God kind of shrinks in proportion to our misguided expectations that life here should be like life there, like the life it's coming for those who are believers in Christ in heaven. We sometimes live under the misguided conception that that's the way it should be now. Forget that we're living in a world that's bound. I heard a preacher on TV one night say this. He said, if you're a Christian, you should have something to show for it. Now, you ain't got to have what everybody else got, but you should have a life where you're comfortable. You know, I heard that and I thought, where, where in the Bible does it say that? It doesn't. It's not in the Bible. Joyful, yes. Trusting and and having confidence in where God is taking you, yes. But what God, what Jesus promised his disciples was what? Persecution. It's gonna be tough, why? Because you live in a world 
that's bound. A lot of Christians aren't comfortable today, beloved. We're the fortunate few that for the most part are. We get uncomfortable when certain problems come into our life or certain medical emergencies, but there are people who live in this world with perfect health and everything else, and they are not comfortable. They're not even safe, and we, we see that more than ever, don't we, these days? Because we live in the valley. We live in a fallen world, and in that, in that environment, God chooses to use adversity for a thousand different purposes in our lives. He uses adversity to discipline us, to remind us that we're we're filled with things that need to change. So the disciplining hand of God comes. He uses it to cause us to help us focus on the things that are really important instead of the things where Satan would like to take our mind and attention off to, temporal things. He uses it sometimes to benefit others. He uses it to grow us. And when God is big in our eyes, see, when when we have a God that we really understand who he really is and how big he is, these adversities, he can use them to accomplish his purposes quickly, but our unbelief ties his hands, causes him to perhaps have to bring more things into our life or allow more things into our life to get our attention, to unleash a great God. We must do what Jesus told the father of this boy to do in verse 41. What did he say? Bring him to me. Bring him to me. Beloved, he invites us to do the same thing. He invites us, bring me your children, your job, your financial difficulties, your temperament problems, the grudge that you absolutely won't let go of. Bring it to me. It's either a big problem or a big God. In the world in which we live that's bound by sin, it's so often it's the big problem and not the big God that we're really paying attention to. So we first have to understand that's the nature of the world in which we live. Second thing that we see in this passage, our ability is bounded. Our ability is bounded. The disciples forgot that, just like we often do. They forgot that their ability was limited. They thought they were going to be capable of doing this, no problem. But look at verse 40. The man says, I begged your disciples to cast it out. But they could not. Now, the disciples didn't fail for lack of trying, right? They wanted to help this man, but they'd forgotten the source of their power. And if you want to see that, let me, let me just show you the sequence here. Look, at, look back at chapter 9, verse 1. When Jesus sent these men out, as we saw a few weeks ago, for their first solo assignment, it says he called them together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Jesus had given them power over how many demons? All. Jesus had given them that unique power for that particular point in time. All demons. And according to verse 6, it worked. They went out and they were able to cast demons out and it was wonderful and they got some success under their belt. (laughs) But that that very success was their undoing. Because now they're believing that they have the power. They're believing in the power rather than in the source of the power. They're concluding that that they can do this. They believe in magic, not in Jesus now. They've come to the point where they go through their normal ritual for casting out demons. Whatever that was, and this demon won't leave. Nothing happened. They were trusting in the method rather than in the master. So easy to do that. So easy to get sidetracked. So easy to think that I can do it, that I can take care of it and becoming an unbelieving believer. We know the disciples had done this because Jesus tells them in verse 41, oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I gonna be with you and bear with you? Jesus is in the disciples' face here. They've begun to think it's about them, that their power, that his power was their power, that they could handle it on their own, that they could take care of this problem. But when they took their eyes off him, 
just like when Peter did when he was walking on the water. Remember what happened? It began to sink. The power wasn't in them. The power was in him. And they were trusting self, not God. We know it's even, we have that verified in Mark's account of this. In Mark chapter 12, chapter 9, verse 29, he says this. He said, Jesus tells them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What does that mean? That means the disciples are trying to do this without even praying. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? But that's where they had gotten. Success had become their enemy instead of something that should have affirmed them further. They were unbelieving believers. When we forget to pray, that's who we become. They thought they could do it themselves. They forgot the nature of the warfare they were in. It's so easy to get deceived when you, when you don't see this just outwardly all the time, right? When the, when the warfare is going on behind the scenes. You know, World War II, things were a lot simpler in some ways, right? The lines were clearly defined. Everybody knew where the front was. Everybody knew who the enemy was. It took a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of experience to create a spy who could, who could infiltrate some other country, who could know the language and speak it in such a way that no one could understand. It was easy, but when you got to Vietnam, guess what? Totally different experience, right? You couldn't tell who the enemy was. They all looked alike. They all spoke alike. And so you didn't know whether this person who was cozying up to you as a friend was really a friend or whether he was just looking for an opportunity to blow you away. You didn't know. That's the nature of spiritual warfare, beloved. What, what does the Bible remind us about Satan? That he comes as an angel of light, which means he's going to look for all the world like the best thing that ever happened to us. And it's not going to be spiritual warfare takes discernment. We don't see the human philosophies for the spiritual warfare that they are. You know, we, we sometimes, we don't see the, 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 what we think is that innocent office flirtation for the spiritual battleground that it is. We don't see the out of control busyness or the violent temper for the spiritual warfare that it really is. Comfort and ease and affluence blind us. And here's the thing that's most important of all, we don't pray. We don't pray. Believers, Christians, don't pray. I think of all the disciplines that we have in our Christian experience, that's the one we talk most about and do the least. We don't pray. Beloved, when we don't pray, we're easy targets. Easy targets. When the disciplines of Bible study and prayer are not consistent, persisted after in our lives, when they're an afterthought, if they're done at all, we're easy targets. We don't see that our spiritual life is on the line every second. And we need to develop a tenacious faith. A tenacious faith that sees God active in everything in life. And you can only do that when you're praying. You can only do that when you're committing everything to him in prayer. That way, if the answer comes right away, you say, thank God. If the answer doesn't come right away, you can say, thank God, it's coming. I just don't know when. But you can't do that if you're not committing it to the Lord in prayer. We've got to be tenacious. I, not long ago, there was a, a news story that came out. A, uh, this was in Bear County, South Dakota. I don't know if any of our South Dakotans know where Bear County is, but in Bear County, South Dakota, a 120-pound mountain lion jumped through the window of a, of a mobile home and attacked a little 18-month-old 18 18 boy named Jason Cowden. Fortunately, his grandmother was there. <laughs> Wouldn't have been the first person you'd have thought of as a, as a helper, right? But his grandmother was there. She grabbed a butcher knife that happened to be close by. And because and, the mountain lion was focused on the little boy, she took a quick stab at him, and then she twisted hard, and the lion fell dead, just like that. She said this, I knew how he had pierced the heart. I said a prayer, 
that the good Lord would give me the strength and the right spot, and he did. Beloved, that's the kind of tenacious faith we need to bring to our everyday lives. What does the Bible say? We have an enemy. The devil goes about like a roaring lion. Only he comes looking like an angel of light, seeking whom he may devour. And may I remind you, that was not written to unbelievers. That was written to believers. And if we're not, if we're not having a devotional life with the Lord that's allowing him to be at work in our life, we will surely be devoured. Our abilities are bounded. On our own, we can't do anything. And we have to come to that recognition so that we'll come in faith to the Lord. So that's the third point. Our Lord, our God is boundless. Our God is boundless. It's not good news. If the world is bounded and our abilities are totally bounded, isn't it good to know that God is boundless? Verse 42, while he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. This is the God, beloved, that we serve. This is the God that if you're a Christian this morning that you belong to. This is the God who is your father. And this is the God who will, who will take on your children, your financial difficulties, your job problems. Whatever else it is in your life, your medical issues, your lack of confidence, your addictions. This is the God who will take them on. But our faith is the thing that unleashes him to do that. I want, to say, I want, you to, I want us to see three things here about his boundless nature. Number one is passion. His passion. He reaches down. He reaches down. That's good news because none of us can reach high enough to get to him. Look at, the, look at verse 37 again. On the next day when they had come down from the mountain, down from the mountain, God's only son came down from the mountain to meet the only son of the man who was in such difficulty. The only son of God didn't have to do that. I mean, he was transfigured on the mountain. He could have gone right back to glory. Would have been his perfect right and privilege to do that. But he didn't. He came down. Where the other man could never have gone, Jesus came down to meet him. And I want to tell you this morning, whoever you are, whatever the difficulty is, however tough life is treating you, the Lord is reaching out to you. The question is, will you reach back? He's not absent. Sometimes it looks like it. Sometimes it feels like it. I know that. He promises that sometimes it'll be like that. That's where your faith has to get tenacious and say, I know he's there, even though I don't see him right now. He's there. The same only begotten son of God who came down to meet that man is the same one who's come down to redeem the person who's most important to you in your life, which is you. He didn't leave you behind. He didn't leave me behind. He's come. Here's a promise. Listen to this. Isaiah 49. Let me just read it. Isaiah 49. I'm reading in verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That's the promise of your heavenly Father to you. He's saying, listen, a woman would forget her nursing baby before I would forget you. That's how important you are to me. It's how much I love you. It's how much I care about you. That's how much I want to be involved in your life and in your problems. That's how much I care. You're written on the palms of my hand. Every time I look, there you are. The only thing that binds him is when we don't believe. 
Secondly is patience, his patience. <clears throat> God responds to faith. He responds to faith. What was the problem here? No faith. Verse 41, oh, faithless and twisted generation. The disciples had forgotten that it was Jesus' power, not their performance, that was the thing that would succeed. When we rely on our own strength, it gets ugly fast. Jesus calls them a twisted generation. The word twisted there means, it means deformed. It means perverted. Uh, it means distorted. Um, if you want to get a picture of this, I mean, you know, think, think, of, think of how you looked the last time, I don't know when the last time you went to a carnival and went in the house of mirrors. I don't even know if they have them anymore, but you've all looked in a mirror somewhere where it just totally distorted you, right? Either made you real fat or real skinny or fat here and skinny there. What is, you, you look totally deformed. Well, that's what, that's what Jesus is saying you look like when, you, when you're not believing. He's saying you're, you're deformed. It's not, that's not what I made you for. It's not what I saved you for. That's not who you are in Christ, but that's who you have become. You're twisted all out of shape. No wonder your life is a horror to you and maybe to those that you have to live with. That's what we are without faith. And so the only cure is faith. Trust in the healing power of the Lord. Trust in the timing of the Lord. The disciples had the authority, but they didn't believe it. And so often, neither do we. Romans 8, 28. Most of us have memorized it, or at least we have a vague knowledge of what it says, right? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. All things. How many things? All things. What do they do? They work for good. Do you believe that? We would all raise our hands and say, oh yeah, I believe that. But, I, you know, but really, do we, do we really believe that? Do you believe that the financial setback and loss that you're going through right now is God's working for good? Do you believe that? Do you believe that the difficulty that you're going through with the, with the relationship on the job, God's using that for good in your life? Do you believe that? Do you believe that, you know, the, the challenge that your husband or wife represents to you because they do certain things that you don't like, do you believe that God is using that for good? The harder things in life? Do you believe? Do we really believe? Find the point of your greatest frustration this morning, whatever it is. And I'm betting we all have one. The point where you're most concerned, the point where you have the most worry going on in your heart and life right now, the thing that's taking your mind away from the sermon to start with. That thing. That's where your unbelief is greatest. That's where you need the most work. That's where you need to begin to trust God. An old commentator, J.C. Ryle, said this about this passage. He said, there are many, because this is a little bit long, so hang with me, but it's good. There are many Christian fathers and mothers at this day who are just as miserable about their children as the man of whom we are reading, the guy that was demon-possessed. Said the son who was once the desires of their eyes and in whom their lives were bound up turns into a spendthrift or a prodigal. And the daughter who was once the flower of the family becomes self-willed and worldly-minded and a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. And their hearts are very well near broken. Now what should a father or mother do in a case like this? They should do as the man did. They should go to Jesus in prayer and cry to him about their child. God's time of conversion may not be ours. He may think fit to prove our faith by keeping us long waiting, but so long as a child lives and a parent prays, we have no right to finally despair about that child's soul. That's what this passage is teaching, beloved. So whether it's a child, whatever the concern, bring it to the Lord. 
We talk a good talk about faith, I think, right? But we don't live it very well. If, if you could just put a tape recorder on yourself. We do a lot more worrying and complaining than we do praying and trusting, do we not? We do a lot more hating and feuding than we do loving our enemy, do we not? We do a lot more whining than we do believing. And you see, every one of those, every one of those is a sign of unbelief, every one. Mark 9 in Mark's account, he gives this wonderful insight into this father. Verse 23 and 24, he says, Jesus said to him, if you, if, you, if you can, because the father had come to Jesus and said, listen, if you can, would you heal him? And Jesus said, figure that out. He says, if you can, all things... This is really an important point, so I hope. <laughs> That's why I'm waiting. <laughs> Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for, he, for the one who believes. And immediately the father cried out and said this. This is, this is one of my favorite places in the Bible. He said, I believe, help my unbelief. That's a really... That's a really great statement, isn't it? It's an acknowledgement of where he really was. It's a confession that, yeah, we're not perfect. It, it gives us all hope that, yes, there's belief, but yes, we are also unbelieving believers. We're all a mix of belief and unbelief. Listen, beloved, I hope you're seeing yourself this morning in this sermon. But all you're doing is just joining the crowd because that's where we all are. We're all a mixture. This man is a great expression of where we all are. But he says, I want you to help my unbelief. I don't want to stay there. I don't want to live there. I want to keep moving along. So help my unbelief. And when you pray like that, God will do that. That's why this should be really part of our daily prayer, you know, triggered by the thing that's, that's most on our mind at that point in time. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief here. I know I wouldn't be worried if it wasn't for unbelief in my life. So help me to get past this. I know I wouldn't be anxious, but for unbelief in my life, so help me to get past this. We have to ruthlessly root it out. Third thing we see is the power of God. He restores broken things. He restores broken things. Look at verse 42. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his Father, what a great statement. This man brought his son to Jesus, so instant healing, right? Now, you didn't read very carefully if that's what you got out of that. The man brought his son to Jesus, and he asked for help, but what's the first thing that happened? The demon took another shot threw him on the ground, he convulsed him, it was like an invisible linebacker tackled this kid and down he went. Went into a great convulsion. Mark describes it this way in Mark 9, 26 and 27. It says, after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said, he's dead. Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. It's really important, beloved, because what God is teaching us here is that restoration is not always instantaneous. Restoration is not always instantaneous. Sometimes things get worse when we bring them to Christ instead of better right away. Sometimes that commitment on our part unleashes not only the power of God, but the power of the enemy that God allows to go on for a period of time. Sometimes we look more dead than alive at first. 
Sometimes the wait is not minutes or days or weeks, but years. Sometimes the answer doesn't even look like what we think it should look like. But listen to this. Please get this. We said it before, and if you wrote it down and forgot it, write it down again. And if you didn't write it down, write it down. Faith is not getting what we want. Faith is getting what we need. Faith is not getting what we want. Faith is getting what we need. This case was was obvious and you could see this man needed this demon taken out, but it's not always that clear in a world that's bound by sin and Satan that has complexities beyond our ability. And so faith doesn't dictate the result. Faith just trusts in God to give the right result. That's what faith is. But the day will come when Jesus will do what he did here. He gave him back to his Father, and so he will do for us. It's a faith that taps into the resources of a big God, a big God who is capable beyond our thoughts. So what must we do? Well, we must ruthlessly root out unbelief in our life. It shows when we disobey God's commands. It shows when we're worried or frustrated. It shows when we act without prayer in anything. I don't care what it is. If you start the day without prayer, You're acting in unbelief. You need God, whether you think you do or not. You know, they, remember the days when ladies used to talk about, is my slip showing? Remember that? Some of you remember that. Some of you don't remember that. My slip is showing. Well, that's what the point is. Our slip is showing when when we're worrying and we're acting without prayer. Our slip is showing. Showing that we we need faith there and we need to be like the woman who was stopped for a traffic violation. Just a little old lady, you know, and the policeman, as, he's, as she's trying to dig out her driver's license to show him, he notices there's a, there's a permit to carry in her purse. He says, uh, he says, I see you have a permit. He says, Are you, do you have a weapon in your possession? She says, yeah, I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a 45 automatic in the glove compartment. He says, oh, really? Anything else you got? She says, yeah, I have a nine millimeter Glock right here in the center console. <laughs> said, Any, anything else? He said, I got a, he said, I got a 38 at the bottom of this purse. He looked at her and he said, lady, what are you so afraid of? She said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything. She was armed, and she was dangerous. And that's the way God wants us, beloved, armed and dangerous and fearless because we're living a life of faith. We're believing with all of our heart and committing to the Lord every day that there's not a single thing that touches our life that he doesn't allow for his good purposes and for his glory. That's a life of faith. That's where God wants us to be. So we need to take inventory this morning and, and, and say, well, okay, where, where is it in my life that I need to bring the majesty of the mountaintop down to the valley where I live? What's the area where I'm not trusting? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this challenge from your word. We long to be believing believers those who are believers with a capital B, not just have come to faith in you and trusted our eternal future to you. And yes, we're followers of Christ, but we're wringing our hands most of the time. We're anxious. And Lord, let's, in a world that's bound by sin, it, it throws huge curves at us. It does. Horrible things happen. And sometimes they happen to us. But Father, help us to be those who are so living by faith. We truly believe nothing could touch us that you didn't allow. And then help us to see the victory in your time and in your way 
Perhaps it'll be in this life, perhaps it'll be in the next, but we know that you will bring it right. So thankful for that. But I know there's a lot of issues out among our congregation today. There's a lot of, there's a lot of grudges that are being held that should have been, forgiveness should have been <clears throat> given a long time ago and we need to give it. We need to give it to you. There's concerns about children that have grown up and they're, they're not following you and we're legitimately concerned and we should be, but we need to give it to you by faith. We face the loss of loved ones, of friends, of spouses in some cases, of, 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 of resources. Suddenly find ourselves limited in ways we didn't expect to and we find the job isn't working out the way we thought it would or should or now the responsibilities have been added on and or there's just a thousand ways, big ones and little ones that we're not really living by faith. We're believing believers. Turn us around, strengthen us, help us by your spirit to become those who show forth the power of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs him. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen.